How many of you heard about Stevens-Johnson syndrome? It is an illness that, although considered rare, it has a high incidence of lasting, long-term, and very devastating side effects, including organ failure, blindness, and death. So let's talk about Stevens-Johnson syndrome. For it to be labeled SJS, for Stevens-Johnson syndrome, it, it is considered an illness that is affecting 10% or less of your body. I'm going to explain to you what in the world this is, what the side of, you know, wh how do we get such a thing, who gets this, what causes it, how can a rash that blisters into second-degree burns and affects all your mucous membranes be so deadly for some people. As I said, SJS is 10% or less of the body that is affected. If it progresses on and consider, considerably gets worse, it then goes past the 10% and is considered to spread over to 30% and then that's considered toxic epidermal necrolysis. It is a worse form of SJS. We used to see this, I, I, it's, even though it says the prevalence is rare, meaning it was a wide range, a few per million, so low prevalence, but high risk because of what it can do to the body and that it has the propensity to cause death. In pediatrics, I saw this often. So in my career working inpatient peds or the ER peds, I've seen Stevens-Johnson syndrome, I would say a good handful of times. So it's kind of baffling for me to think that it's only a couple per million. It is something that, uh, these children, when they came in and were diagnosed with SJS, off they went to a bigger pediatric hospital onto the burn unit, and often they were treated there or treated in the intensive care unit. These children looked horrible, were miserable, and it is a very miserable illness to have. So who can get SJS or further on TEN? It can affect any age, children, adults, older adults, it can affect any race or ethnicity and anybody in the entire world. It is seen all over the world. It is something that is diagnosed by a team of specialists. So the person who comes in is going to have a team of people say, surgery, medicine team, nurses, infectious disease, dermatology, and of course, the burn unit physicians. Mortality depends on lots of things. Mortality depends on things like how much skin is involved. Remember, 10% or less, over 30%, around 30%, somewhere in the middle or above. The age of the person, the other health problems, and how quickly the treatment is started. Like so many things, we have to start treatment immediately to have a more favorable outcome. Mortality risk estimates. And I'm going to list below where I read these things, these statistics from, and give you a lot more resources, including a website that is helpful for people who've been diagnosed with SJS or as a family member with this. Stevens Johnson syndrome, approximately 5 to 10% death rate in many reports. Toxic epidermal necrolysis, or 10, much higher, often 25 to 50% mortality. I told you who can get it. Anybody can get it. We saw it in pediatrics. Adults get it as well. Why do people get it? Okay, so here's the big question. Why? Why do some people get this and some not? And why is it that if it has to do with medication and or illness or both, why is it that maybe somebody can take amoxicillin many times over, but this one particular time with this particular illness, it produces this devastating disease of SJS. That is uh, a question that has not been answered yet. I'm going to give you typical average SJS progression, and this it can be faster or slower depending on those factors I gave you earlier. The first phase that providers usually see and the individual is experiencing are flu-like symptoms or upper respiratory infection type symptoms, an average bad cold, that sort of thing. So if somebody has flu-like symptoms with a fever, body aches, and they aren't feeling well, headache, they might go to urgent care, they might go to the ER, and they might treat at home, which would be Advil, Tylenol, Naproxen, maybe that sort of thing. That might be day one through three. The next phase would be after that, which would be day four and five, and that's when individuals often see, but not always, it can progress faster or slower, but they often will see that purpley red rash. And that rash can start in the upper body and then often progress to the mouth, to the mucous membranes of the entire body. Genitalia, eyes are affected severely, arms and legs, 
and chest. It can spread further from head to toe for that individual. I'm going to insert some pictures. I really wanted to insert really what it really looks like and how bad somebody's mouth and tongue and, and uh, eyes can look. But I thought for sure somebody might report that. And so I want you to Google it. But I will put up some pictures because it's important that we know what does this look like? Is this just any old rash? It can be, it can mimic other things too. But it's really important to get it checked out just in case it's Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Often it's triggered by a viral illness or bacterial illness. Often, but not always, the person might be taking antibiotics. They may have been prescribed some antibiotics or they're treating at home with Advil and Tylenol or something like that. And it progresses, it gets worse. And then they're seeing this all over body purpley rash. That is a sign to get in immediately to the ER because some other things can have that purpley rash as well. It can also be a devastating illness. So go ahead and get it checked out. It's better to be safe. Days five through seven or around there is the blistering phase. And that is where the rash turns into these uh, awful, horrible, painful blisters. And that is all over the body, mouth, eyes, all over, not just say on the chest or arms. Day seven and beyond is when the skin often is sloughing off and uh, into raw, large patches and sores all over the body. That's why the individual is often treated in the ICU or in the burn unit for better care because this is involving skin as well as organs. Ophthalmology is involved for the eyes. This is a really devastating and miserable illness. Beyond that, there are months of healing, not just a couple days and you're healed. It is months of healing. Some people are in uh, the ICU and are intubated. Some people are have milder forms of SJS and 10, but it is something that has to be treated uh, and it is a recovery. I'm going to go over some of the main medications that seem to be triggers for SJS. And like I mentioned, often it comes along with an illness or it can be a cold that a person just kind of uh, puts aside as, yeah, I was feeling kind of achy for a couple days, but now I've got this on. And the medications that people tend to take that seem to trigger this are the NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, like I said, like the Advil, naproxen, that sort of thing, antibiotics, anti-seizure drugs, gout medication, and more. Like I mentioned, it can affect anybody, but I wanna stress that those who are HIV positive uh, have what I read as a hundredfold increased chance of developing SJS. Why does awareness matter? Learning about these types of symptom signs and uh, what this rash looks like is something that's really critically important because again, it matters because of prompt treatment, getting to the ER quickly, getting treatment with your physician, wherever you're going to go that you feel that you want to be seen, but get in and be seen promptly because better outcomes for earlier intervention. If you have a friend, family member, child who has Stevens-Johnson syndrome or who has uh, gone through this, it changes their lives usually forever. It's a really traumatic event. It, I can't stress enough how traumatic it is on their body and the pain and misery they go through from their genitalia, their entire skin, their mouth and their eyes. It affects every part of their body for a very long time. And supportive care is really important. They're in the hospital for quite some time and then they might get discharged home. But remember, getting out of the hospital or getting out of the ICU is often just the journey that keeps on going. There is the next step, like physical therapy, uh, therapy with psychology, ICU trauma that they've experienced that is a real phenomenon. How can you help a friend or coworker who's experienced Stevens-Johnson syndrome? I say, just like anybody who's in the hospital, help them to keep their hospital room positive, calm, peaceful, and stress-free. So a lot of clutter in hospital rooms, which is easy to happen, clutter, garbage, people bring in food, pizza boxes, all kinds of cups and things from the store, from going and getting themselves some ca coffees. And before you know it, that hospital room, uh, well, it looks pretty bad. The nurses will tidy up and clean up as much as they can. But I'm just stressing that any room with anybody in it who is ill, needs to have an environment that is stress-free of clutter, garbage, a lot of odors and smells, and 
to not just assume that the nursing staff is going to clean up all of the garbage. I, obviously, I'm speaking from experience, and those of you who are medical people know what this is like. Sometimes we can't even get into the room, or we have people that are laying and sleeping and sleep during the day even, as well as some people that sleep during the night, and we're trying to step over individuals and take care of that person who's very ill. In closing, even though this might be considered a rare illness, although I've seen it many times, this is still an illness that needs prompt attention. Always check out the photos, look online, get yourself familiar with what Stevens-Johnson syndrome looks like and other different rashes. I've done a couple videos on meningitis. How about that purpley rash? Getting familiar with those things and knowing this is something I need, that needs prompt attention will save lives and will have better outcomes for that individual. If you like topics that have to do with medicine, oopsies, and myths and facts, please consider subscribing. I'll see you in the next health video.